Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today one of my oldest and dearest friends. Her name is Nikki Costello. She is the teacher's teacher. If you teach yoga, this is an episode that you will want to bookmark and grab your notebook and take some notes. This is the real deal. And this has been one that I've been sort of holding in my back pocket for a long time to talk to her. I wanted to wait until the sort of COVID furor had died down and we could just have a conversation about the work at hand. Nikki Costello is a certified level three Iyengar yoga teacher. She is a certified yoga therapist for 30 years, and we are roughly the same age. Her teaching has been inspired by annual trips to India, including RIMYI, which is uh, Ramamani Iyengar Memorial Yoga Institute, the study of scriptural and philosophical texts, and a daily practice of meditation. In 2013, 2014 or so, she was a contributing editor at Yoga Journal. She wrote the magazine's basics column. This is a badass. In 2016, she was named one of the 100 most influential teachers in America. She holds an MA in traditions of yoga and meditation from SOAS in, uh, University of London. She is the featured Iyengar yoga teacher on GLOW. Since 2020, Nikki has taught weekly online classes at uh, Nikki Costello, The Practice, and we'll make sure to link you up to her website. Nikki, welcome. Elena, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I've watched the uh, podcast grow and your incredible way of engaging all of your guests. So I'm just thrilled to be in that seat today. Mm, I love you so much. Gosh, we had the occasion to see each other relatively recently, and it was such a joy to see you flourishing. You are now in California, correct? I am. I live in Santa Barbara, California. Beautiful. And your your online offerings are thriving, and I would love to focus there because I have a fair number of teachers who are constantly asking me, hey, who would you, with whom would you do a training right now? And, you know, where would you go? And would you do it in person or online? There are a few names that I use. Yours is always at the top of this list. So first, I'd love for you to share with our listeners so he or she can look right now. What is your website, please? My website is NikkiCostello.com. And two K's. Yes. One I. <laughs> N-I-K-K-I Costello, the way you think it's spelled with two L's, dot com. Go look and see what she's up to. Nikki, you are one of the people in my world who have helped me to raise the bar in my own teaching, my own studies. Your caliber of teaching is so high. We have taught together several times. I still refer to the notes from our times teaching together, where I would be sitting on the side furiously scribbling the notes from your turn teaching. And I want to first welcome you to share with us your sort of path to this place where you are now squarely in the seat of the teacher's teacher. Ha. Huh. <laughs> you know, I, I've really been blessed since my teenage years of engaging in teaching. Uh, I grew up as a dancer. My mom owned dance studios in the Chicagoland area, and I started teaching uh, children dance. So from a very early age, I was engaged in both the practice and the sharing uh, in 
these physical disciplines. When I attended NYU, uh, once again, I became a teacher's assistant for movement for actors. And really it is there that uh, I started the study of yoga and also what it meant to be aware of the body deeply. And I studied that through um, voice training and Alexander technique. When I recognized how potent and powerful the practice of yoga was for me, I chose to pursue a you know, deeper study in my own education in New York City at the time uh, of yoga. And I, I just want to say that at that time, we didn't have a lot in a sense, to choose from. It wasn't as though the city was kind of swarming with teachers, with master teachers. There were very specific lineages that were available. And I started as a vinyasa student at Jiva Mukti Yoga and then continued to study Ashtanga Yoga. And for those years that I was studying Ashtanga Yoga in the primary series, I recognize the extraordinary discipline that was required to maintain a daily practice. And I would say that that was one of the most pivotal moments in my life around how to witness the mind and the body and the breath that each and every day you would attend to the same form, to the same sequence. And yet there were always changes that you always showed up as you were. It was never the same. And I think that that was one of the learnings that I had at that time that made me aware that in fact, yoga is and was then a spiritual discipline. Very organically, uh, that led to me um, meeting uh, Iyengar yoga teachers in New York City. The Iyengar Institute of New York um, was thriving at the time uh, under the guidance of Mary Dunn. She's actually one of the teachers in our lineage whose mother who had gone to India uh, in the 70s, perhaps earlier, I'm fairly certain it was the 70s. Her mother's name was Mary Palmer, and she's the one that invited BKS Iyengar to the United States for the first time. So my connection then to Mary, to her mother, to how uh, I became intimately connected to um, BKS Iyengar happened in that way through classes in New York City. Uh, I And I want to say this for, for all of you that are listening, a lot of my reflections, sort of the looking back, is where I connected the dots. When, when it was happening, I was following I was following this feeling inside where, um, as I was learning, the light was getting brighter, right? And that was really all I had because there wasn't the internet. There wasn't, um, a lot of, um, images. There were books that I could buy, but really, really, really what I had was where do I want to go and how will I know that I'm on the right path and light the feeling of light was really a part of that. So after I completed my first uh, teacher's training, I want to I want to put a little um, highlighter pen on that, like one of those little markers, because I want to elaborate on that when you're done. Very good. Um, so again, there was a, a a wonderful pace in my early twenties in this pursuit, and I was extraordinarily blessed to meet my meditation master in the, uh, mid nineties. And then I began to see the, um, that the yoga practice and specifically asana and pranayama were the way in which I could fortify my own body and reach and penetrate inside to experience what inner strength, um, felt like. And I just want to say that it is through the practice of meditation that that light became even more profound, even more bright through uh, an awakening, through an understanding that what we do in our body, the way we acknowledge um, the discipline of practice in the body allows us to serve. And so my path then moved toward um 
very, again, very organically toward a path of service. And I was living between upstate New York and India. And it was during that time of, of going between these two places that, um, that I was able to meet BKS Iyengar also in person in Pune. And I knew that I had, again, made the right choice and said to myself, I'm going there, I'm going to Pune, I'm going to study with the Iyengars. And that was around 2000. So now looking back, we're that's 22 years, right? <laughs> um, unbelievable. Yeah, it, it is. It feels like yesterday. It, it is unbelievable. And it does feel like yesterday. But I, I, I'm highlighting here this kind of convergence of, in my life, having the right teachers at the right time and guided toward them because the questions I was asking myself were being answered in these exchanges, right? In these, um, in these guides. And so it was both a very internal, um, directed path as well as having the questions lead me to the one that could actually support and guide, um, me in the direction that I wanted to go in. So I always felt as though I was in collaboration with lineage. I was in collaboration with teachers. Um, I was in uh, a process of learning that was very clear, uh, you know, even 30 years ago would be a lifelong pursuit. So I think that when you've spent enough time around a lot of teachers and Um, as you've probably heard, uh, different modalities in the body, um, different ways of practice that I began to notice that someone would step into the room to attend a class that I was teaching. And I could see, uh, I could see practice in them. I could see patterns in them. I could understand where they had come from, where there might be, uh, I, I want to use the word gap because I feel like, you know, all traditions have these incredible ways of showing us ourselves, and some highlight um, the physical discipline, some highlight uh, our our emotional connections, some look more deeply at our nervous system. So I feel like every way of practice has kind of dominant features. Having done many of the practices that are um, with us today, I find myself being able to recognize the student in front of me and where they had come from. And being able to then give or even kind of cultivate, curate the teachings in such a way that they could hear them where they were. They could experience uh, what could be added based on what they had come with and where they wanted to go. So that very instinctual, organic um, way of seeing and observing students, I think one could say that's the reason that um, I started to become a teacher of teachers. Mm. That makes sense. And actually being able to look back at those times and feel into kind of how you carried yourself and what you were doing at the time, there was a lot of clarity in the way that you moved through the world. I always felt at turns both in awe of you and completely connected and safe with you. So there was never this sort of hierarchical difference, even though I do feel that you were taking things to a very serious level very early on, which I appreciated and really admired. Of your Iyengar studies, what about that tradition drew you in and what kept you there? I really love this question, Elena. Uh, And I think it's important whenever we have chosen a path to re-examine the why. Why? Why did I start? Why am I staying? Why do I continue? And within that continuing, how do I contribute now 
um, based on having been in it for the time that I have. So this answer is quite simple. As I shared earlier, I had an Ashtanga yoga practice. I had a vinyasa practice. And when I began practicing Iyengar yoga, this word clarity that that you mentioned um, was something that you saw in me. Iyengar yoga had a clarifying effect on me. Uh, for instance, I remember um, really, really, really not liking Pincha Mayarasana, right? Forearm stand. And one of the reasons I didn't like it was because I felt this incredible thickness, heaviness in my chest, a stiffness in my shoulders, just a feeling of being stuck in my body. And it was one of these poses that exposed really um, a stuckness, an inability to kind of navigate or move around. And I had felt that for years. And I, uh, took an Iyengar yoga class. And of course the sequence comes to Pinchamayarasana. And I was given, um, a block <laughs> to use between my thumb and forefinger. And I was given a belt to harness the outer elbows and a wall. Now, many of you that, um, that may be in a vinyasa tradition or an Ashtanga tradition haven't necessarily relied upon props, or if you have, um, you know, maybe a limited amount. At the time, I had not used props in this way. So as I'm situating myself with these supports, right, the block, the belt, and the wall, I kicked up to pinch my arasana and I floated up. And it was one of those moments where I felt light. I felt free. Uh, I had this image of the Mayur, you know, the peacock. Oh my gosh, my my hips, my legs felt like feathers. And I came out of that pose and I thought, wait a second, like, why did that happen today? I've been doing this pose for years. Why? What happened? What was different? Of course, the props were different, but there was this clarity around everything that had happened in that class before the Pinchamayarasana. It was the support and the instruction given to go into that pose. And it was the reinforcement of instruction while in it. And that was it. That sort of sealed the deal for me because when we recognize that we're pushing against our own efforts repeatedly and not getting anywhere, (laughs) right? Like I'm not getting anywhere with me. I'm not getting anywhere with my, with my will. Yeah. What changed having guidance? What changed having support? What changed having one lead me there because they had been there before that I was actually able to experience ease. Now I consider those moments, grace moments, right? I did have to make an effort, but the experience, or I would say, and the experience of that effort was a taste of effortlessness. And that was the moment where I knew if I can have this kind of clarity in one pose, imagine if I had the lens of an Iyengar yoga teacher to see, to articulate, to demonstrate, and to guide others. Uh, Because service was ultimately the most important part of teaching for me. You really articulated that well the first time, the strap, the good instruction, the floating, the feather. Unbelievable. I can feel it in my body. It makes me want to go do pinch of my rasana this afternoon during my practice, sister, which is what I will do. (laughs) Oh my gosh, with a strap and a wall. Okay, so I remember several times taking your class at Kula. I remember taking a class, I believe, no, maybe I was with you taking a class over at that little loft in Soho. Whose house was that? Was that with Skylar? No, I think that was Sri. No, 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 no. It was on like Broom Street. No, not Broom. It was on... Hold on, I need to put myself on Houston Street. Mercer. It was on the corner of Mercer and Houston. 
or maybe the next block west in Houston, there was a loft where a very serious Iyengar, te- may have been Mary, a serious Iyengar teacher was teaching. And I, we would go to her class, and I think I was with Skylar at the time, and we would go take her class. Oh, can't remember the name. Any any case, it always moved me how there was no talk necessarily of spirit. It wasn't like I didn't resonate with it personally because I really love taking a little journey in my practice through myself, through, you know, the the process of efforting over efforting and then releasing the effort and having the experience of freedom, both in the body and in the heart mind continuum but I loved taking those classes. I loved taking your classes because I felt connected to my viscera in a different way. And I think that anyone who has taken a proper Iyengar yoga class can say that. And once you have that experience, it doesn't just disappear from your body. It's always there. And there's always a new way of looking at things once you've had that experience. So just a really a note of thanks all the classes that you gave at Kula to the teachers. I think they were on Wednesdays. Am I correct? Mm, in that? Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Midday Wednesday when I lived down in the financial district and I could just walk over there and just jump in. I loved the seriousness with which all the teachers addressed and approached your work. It all felt like I was, I, I, I sort of knew then that I was part of something important that would not be replicated again interesting that that came to pass. You know, uh, I do want to highlight this word (laughs) serious and seriousness because as, as one matures, I think anything that we truly like, you know, it's like, we want to get good at something. We want to do our best. That certain focus can, uh, can be experienced right in this, in this like serious, this is a serious pursuit. Uh, I hope that you can feel that I'm smiling when I say this right now, because the thing that, um, really has always been true for me is the play, like the love, the, the real like love of the pursuit, you know? So, for me, discipline has always opened me toward freedom, toward feeling liberated in the body. And I, uh, I've hold, I should say, let me say that again. I've held the intent in my being since I started practicing yoga that I can get free that when I discovered the practice of yoga, I experienced what could be considered a graduated, uh, little by little, I'm getting free. And how we define what we're getting free from or what we're getting free of, (laughs) the getting free for me meant allowing the practice, like as you spoke about your journey and how you've taught and what's appealed to you, the, uh, the pursuit of being in lineage for me has been about watching something that I've done for decades still and continue to reveal pockets of freedom, right? Like spaces where more freedom resides in me. And I'm saying in me as if it's an internal space. It's also very, very mental. It's very emotional. It's like, wow, I can drop that or wow, I can let go of that. Wow, I can release this. And much of that happens for me because there are certain well-worn patterns in the body from repetition that I don't have to kind of start at square one and say, oh, I'm doing this pose and um, 
how should I say there's, there's that we often use this expression, like do it as if it's new every day. Well, it is new every day, but there's something that I will say when we speak about the neurology in the body, when we speak about cellular memory, when we speak about, uh, impressions or imprints, right? When there's repetition and for me, the particular repetition of the actions and the intelligence of Iyengar yoga. When, when I recognize that I've actually cultivated this repetition in my body, more and more ease is revealed, right? More and more uh, effortlessness comes because there are certain things that I actually don't have to think about so as to be able to deepen the connection because now I'm on another level within myself. I'm on another layer within myself. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, it does. Yeah, it does. And so I just want to call that out. Like Mm. practice is about repetition, you know, and practicing who we are (laughs) and, and over and over and over again and finding those things that we love coming back to the word seriousness, it's like, I'm still smiling. Cause like, I know, <laughs> I know I've been seen as serious. And I know that in some ways Iyengar yoga has been something that some teachers avoid because it feels serious or it feels um, rigid or it feels kind of so formed that it's like, well, where, where am I within this? If I'm putting this thing on, if I'm, if I'm putting on this structure, all I can say is that like the structure that's required at the beginning becomes so present and yet malleable over time and soft over time and translucent over time that, um, I just, uh, you know, maybe it's me, maybe it's not the specific method. I'm not, I don't want to attribute it all to saying it's done this way, but I have to say, I do, uh, I do recognize that when the great seers and sages of ancient India and throughout, you know, the centuries have passed on the teachings, you know, hold, hold this to be true. You can get free. (laughs) That liberation is gradual and it's real. And that an ultimate state of self-actualization, self-realization is made up of small freedoms, (laughs) right? Uh, daily moments of recognition. You know, when I hear you use the word translucent, something changed in me. The fact of finally coming to a practice every day, I I really arrived in that during COVID, starting in about mid-year 2020. I don't miss a day anymore. I used to miss and I don't miss a day anymore. Even if I have like a workout schedule, of weights and so forth, I'm still going to practice yoga. The translucency is the magic of it. That's the word. Never, I would have never arrived at that myself. But there comes to be this place where, and I think this happens also as we get older and wiser, comes to be a place where because you're doing the same thing again, You can sort of see through it and you can sense into what it's either giving you or taking from you. And it's very easy to be discerning when that comes to pass. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it makes total sense. I mean, I think that when we translucence, transparency, clarity, um, a a kind of radiant, right? Intelligence, not a mental intelligence necessarily, but when we actually imbue our mind into the cellular structure, into each cell of the body, that cell changes its composition, if that makes sense. It's like we are uh, bodies of matter, 
right? But elementally, elementally, we have an opportunity to imbue each and every cell with light. And that light is connected to our, uh, our mind and installing in the body our intelligence, installing in the body our clarity, right? So sometimes we, when we say, or when I say a word like clarity or translucency, it's very, very connected to the eyes, right? It's connected to our seer, the way we're able to perceive. And that perception is an extraordinary aspect of our being that undergoes transformation. Because when we start practicing, we do have to do a lot more sorting, right? It's, it's sort of like you're, the, the word discrimination or discernment, right? We're sorting out the real from the unreal. Asatoma, satgamaya, tamasoma, jyotir gamaya, mrityormam amritam gamaya. Like we're sorting out, we're separating the light from the dark, the real from the unreal. And that ability to do that over time is hastened. It's quickened by our repetition. And it's quickened because we're an embodied practitioner. And that feeling, right, the feeling in the body becomes lighter and lighter and simultaneously more and more grounded. In a sense, more and more weight or a kind of gravitas is there in, in our illumination, in our light. And I'm saying this specifically because we often talk about the you know, the polarity of, of, of the hatha, the, the sun and the moon, the pairs of opposites. If you consider someone that you may have encountered, someone that you admire, someone that may be in the public eye, a great master, a great teacher, is there not profound presence? Like that person is standing on the earth like no other. They're taking that space on the planet and their physicality on the planet itself is potent. And at the same time, <laughs> brilliance, light is emanating. Which takes us back to the very first moments of this chat. <laughs> Thank you for cycling us back there. There's an interesting way in which that translates into a real day in the life of you or me or our listener, where <clears throat> it doesn't have to be something, you know, profound that happens. It can be the way you stir your coffee or the way you sit down and place your plate on the table, eating by yourself, just super mindfully. That light is there. You know, there's, there's nothing and it's everything the way you pay attention. You have a uh, practice. It's called the embodied practice. And I want to talk about that because our listener, upon hearing you expound in the way that you do, will want to study with you. And I'm interested in teaching our listener about this offering that you have and why it's so important for us. You know, um, during this time that we've been in these two years that began with isolation, right? Having to separate ourselves from the day-to-day -day activities and the people and the work and the movement and the travel and all of those things that uh, we did, that both you and I did. In that time of isolation, you know, I've, I've noticed that I've had an opportunity to listen more deeply. And this, you know, this uh, way in which I'm describing the embodied practice is 
the the recognition that um, that we're human, <laughs> that we're in a body, that we're very much a part of and affected by our environment, uh, by the um, the climate of the world, by what's happening in parts of the world that are thousands of miles away from where we're situated, even in, in our isolation, even though we feel distance spatially, there's a way in which our experience of time and our connection to other parts of the world and our planet has been um, become more and more and more proximal. So I'm saying this because as I started to listen, this is came to the surface, I would say, or kind of started to come out um, in the fall of 2021. I thought, you know, as a teacher who's been um, doing this for decades, what now? Like what, what is, what is my purpose? Like what, what really do I have to offer at this time? What's really important? And there's an entire page on my website that's dedicated to this aphorism that I wrote. Simplicity is profound. Basics are essential. And that simplicity is profound, basics are essential, that became the way in which I was able to reconsider the commitments I have in my life, the way I'm treating uh, the activities of my day, the way I organize myself with my family. And I recognize that like this is the uh, trajectory of how I want to be working and how I want to be teaching. And so that has led to um, a class on my platform called the Practice Hour, which happens twice a week. Uh, And those two hours, right, split, you know, into two hour segments twice a week are an exploration of exactly that. How can I become simple? And how can that simplicity clarify? How can it lead me to where I want to go? Um, in a sense, I know that I can teach a challenging advanced asana practice. However, I feel that and I will do that and it'll, you know, I'll, I'll come out with those every so often. And my students will recognize that that was a, you know, <laughs> a, a different, a different tone on a particular day. But often when I choose to do that, in a sense, advance, challenge, um, provoke, it's because there have been several hours prior where we've set the foundation or we've, we've set the direction of how to be in a simple and profound relationship with ourselves, the essentials, the basics, right? So this is, it's been a really beautiful progression this year. And where I'm situated now in month five of doing this is, is, is an actual kind of awe of the effect of listening when we really hear what's needed and then can follow through and can, and can execute it in such a way that the impact that it had on me is rippling out. And so the embodied practice, which is, um, now something that is, has also come through in that same way that is being, uh, formed is, the first and foremost, the recognition that we are human and we're in a body and that yoga in itself is and can be a radical expression of self-actualization. 
And if I'm going to say a little bit more about that, to know oneself deeply is radical. To deepen a connection to our innermost core is resistance. And I'm using that word now specifically not to say resisting something. I'm saying it as an act of resistance. There's so much in our climate and in our world today that is geared toward how productive we can be, how efficient we can be, how formed we can be, how do we know, how do we do, 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 right? If we're actually attuned to the simplicity of our being, that's a radical choice. And it's resisting the, uh, it's resisting this sort of like tone that our life has to be a push to get from point A to point B. The reason that I'm saying that yoga is a radical expression is that when we look deeply at the history of yoga, those who chose to practice yoga extracted themselves from the day-to-day life of productivity thousands of years ago. And they were called forest dwellers, they would leave the societal structure and, and, and extract themselves so as to pursue this path of self-realization. We're at a time where we're actually being asked to do that while investing more into the world that we're living in. In a way, I see that as a massive, in a sense, up level. Can we be attuning ourselves to ourselves in such a way that we show up in the world and we don't add to that push of productivity, to that act of, you know, um, consumption? We actually show up and do what we do in our beingness. And I think that that's, uh, that that act is what is and requires a sense of urgency right now. Urgency. Like we have no more time to waste. And as we get older, we recognize that we see the years that have passed and that sense of urgency to show up in the world right now and say, I've, I've accumulated, <laughs> right? I've accumulated. I've, I've, um, I've gathered, I've accumulated, not, not things, not objects, but self-worth, <laughs> uh, inner wisdom, put it to good use, my friends. And it's through your body, it's through the gravity of your body on the earth, and through your lightness of being, through your awareness, that you will have a profound effect on all of those around you, no matter what you're doing. That's the embodied practice. It's a, it's a real pleasure to listen to you talk about this, because the putting the words to the closeness to oneself, the intimacy with oneself uh, as one grows older and wiser. That's the whole kind of cookie jar, you know, it's a big treat. And I wonder if maybe our listener who might've been resisting getting older might be seeing it a little bit differently now for having heard what you've just said. So thank you for that. I love the idea of just making sure that our listener is deeply familiar with how to find you and study with you. We've talked earlier in the podcast about NikkiCostello.com. I'm going to spell that for you again in case you don't have it. It's N-I-K-K-I, Costello, C-O-S-T-E-L-L-O.com. There you will find her online offerings, practices. I believe you have some writings there. Is that true? Or am I making that up? 
I, um, I do have some writing on my website. Yeah, I seem to remember. There's actually a really, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have also a page um, on my site in my about section of student experiences. And uh, some of the extraordinary people that I've had an opportunity to, um, to be with, to teach, to work alongside of, have shared more about the effect of our work and dialogue. And, and I turn people to that because it, it does really portray, um, who I am and how this work has come through me and the impact that it's had. Yeah. I don't do this often, but I'm actually going to type in your website and I want to read it to our listener and as a parting, uh, salvo. <laughs> About page student experiences. Here we go. Nikki enabled me to articulate the purpose of my work with greater insight and clarity. Nikki has an innate ability to listen to the unspoken, to ask provocative questions, summarize the big picture ideas, and synthesize one's purpose into concrete action oriented goals. Beautiful. So you're also working with people in other ways other than yoga. I am. Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that, um, as you know, Elena, and you've done so beautifully when you start to teach yoga and you've done it for many years, you, you just come to realize you're wearing many hats. Like one day you, you just realize I'm wearing many hats here, uh, from, and, and, and I would say that the one that is, uh, opening up even more fully now is, um, coaching and the coaching, um, is, you know, some, some people that I coach are executives, they're founders of companies, they're, they're leading teams of thousands or more and their, um, relationship to their body had to be tuned not necessarily that they were going to be a yoga practitioner. It's embodied. They needed a connection to their embodiment so that their message could get out there. So yes, I teach, uh, in the Iyengar yoga tradition. Yes, I teach yoga. And one of the things that's revealed in that teaching is that, uh, you have the capacity to guide people into their body. And when we're in our body, we're able to, uh, to give something else in any profession, in any work, when we're connected in that way. And we have that level of sensitivity, our voice changes, our expressions change, the way we motivate changes, the way we lead changes. So, so yes, I'm working with a wide variety of, um, of folks. How do we figure out a new word for the C O A C H? I feel the same way. I, oh my gosh. You know, we, it's, it's funny because we are, um, you know, language then starts to shape or define something and then it has its limitations. Right. Um, yeah. We need to find we, another we word definitely and we do. need to do it now. We definitely do. In the same way that like we needed to find a new word for like motivational speaker. It's like, actually, I'm not just here to motivate you. I'm, I'm, there's actually a different, uh, there's something different there. There's something more there. Uh, and that's why, you know, teacher and the word guru has for, you know, centuries held, (laughs) it's held everything, certainly in the yogic tradition, but also, um, in all of my visits back and forth to India, um, musical masters are called gurus, right? Um, business entrepreneurs that succeed are called gurus. You know, there, there's a certain, there's a certain way that we, that we, and, and probably, necessarily kind of shy away from using that word in, in, in our context and in our upbringing and in our, you know, 
environment right now. But I certainly would love a word that could acknowledge that uh, in this profession, you are an artist, you're a philosopher, you're a scientist, uh, you're a public speaker, you're a psychologist, you're a, a nurse, a caretaker, a mentor, right? I'm saying all of these other things because there's aspects. And of course, I'm not saying that I'm a licensed therapist or, you know, uh, a, a doctor. What I am saying though, is that when you develop a craft fully, you begin to see how you draw upon, um, those skill sets in other professions, uh, and you start to realize that you're able to see things through different lenses, depending on who you're working with. So yeah, let's figure out another word. <laughs> yeah. But let's just get on that right away. Start texting me because I need to do this right now. There's one more testimonial that I wanted to read. It's called The Best of Yoga. Seth Powell, who's a founder and director of yogic studies at Harvard. Hello. Nikki is at the vanguard of modern yoga, bridging traditional asana and meditation practice with a zest for serious academic scholarship and rigor. Grounded in decades of yogic practice, teaching, and training, Nikki represents the best of yoga. I delight in sending students her way. That word serious came back, and I want to just make sure our listener is aware that you can turn back like 20, 30 minutes and get a new definition of that word and a new understanding of that word. And keep in mind too, and I think this is a good way to close, the closeness with ourselves is what we're cultivating now. It has nothing to do with perfection of the poses, even though that will be a result, a natural consequence. It has nothing to do with, you know, being a good student, good in quotes, everything to do with the capacity that you have to get to know yourself and as Nikki pointed out this radical intimacy with yourself is kind of the end game if there was to be an end game at all and I wish our our listener you know may the force be with you because there's going to be a moment or several moments in time as Nikki said where we're sort of accruing these moments of translucency and connection with ourselves that become a state of being. And there's nobody that can take that from you. So thank you for that, Nikki. Wow. Elena, thank you for that incredible summary. <laughs> really. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm so inspired by your capacity to listen. And it, it makes me just sort of smile to, uh, to be able to, hear you in a sense, say back, play back, uh, in such clarity, succinctness, um, what it is that we're doing here, you know? And, um, I just, I'm really grateful. So I appreciate you and I appreciate being here with all of your listeners who I hope I encounter, uh, very soon again. Yes. I'm sure you will. I'm sure several will find you. Uh, Nikki Costello.com, two K's, two L's, I and Nikki, my good friend. I look forward to more with you. I look forward to maybe even someday getting to teach alongside you once again. And maybe we can reprise that Pornamidam, uh, Pornamadam, Pornamudachate. <laughs> Pornasya, Pornamadaya. Thank you, sister. I love you. Thank you. Let's come up with a new word for coach also, please. Bing, 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 bing. That's our homework. That's our homework. That is our homework. If any of you, if you're listening and you have an idea, please help us. <laughs>